All right, it's uh, 8.28, so we're a couple minutes early, but I think we can get started on the guardianship case. Ms. Riddle, I think that's your case. It's 20 GA380. Hold on, you're not muted. I mean, you are muted. Yeah, you're, I can't hear you. There you go. There. I'm sorry, Anna. All right. Um, this is a motion for order to determine indigency. I'm not sure why I'm hearing it because normally I don't hear those things, but um well I, I'm aware of that, Your Honor. Um in, in my motion, the court will see that I reference the magistrates right. report and recommendations. Right. Uh the magistrate found uh at page two, paragraph nine, that Nicholas Mejia Barberi was indigent and waived the bond. Right. The, the diff difficulty that we're having is that uh, Fort Myers administration, in order to pay the examiners, has requested that I obtain an order from the court indicating that Mr. Barberi is indigent. Um, they, they have not accepted the fact that the court approved this because uh -huh. it wasn't in the court. Even, even though the order granting the petition has been approved by the court. Okay, yes. well, again, I don't have a problem with that, so send me an order. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and probably again, I don't have a problem with a hearing either. But probably if you if you need to next time, just um, just send me an order. Yes, I will do that, Your Honor. I I will include it in in some of the documentation in a little clearer fashion. Okay. Good deal. All okay. right. Thanks, Miss Thank Riddle. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Vince. So we're done with Court Smart. Okay, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. All right, first case uh, that I think is still in my docket is um, Jot Car versus GS Homes, 13 CA 3139. Anybody here for the plaintiff? Good morning, Your Honor. This is Kevin Kyle for the plaintiff. All right, and how about for defendant, defendants? Anybody here? All right, this is a motion to compel post-judgment discovery for failure to file a fact information sheet, correct, Mr. Kyle? Yes. Okay. Um, well, it is 8.31, so nobody's appearing for the defendants and showing me why they haven't um, proceeded to uh, submit that. So anything you want to tell me? Well, the 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 relevant facts are are, are that this this final judgment was from six and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And and the uh, defendant, the uh, the uh, individual was uh, 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 filed a bankruptcy that lasted over three and a half years. Um, and and this debt was not discharged in that bankruptcy. My my firm actually represented the plaintiff in the bankruptcy case, and got a a court order from the bankruptcy court saying that this um, debt was not not dischargeable. Right. Um, and so uh, the bankruptcy case just just ended a couple months ago, and so that's why we are now trying to enforce the the final judgment and seeing what the discovery is. All right. So I'm going to grant your motion. At this point, I'm not going to threaten to put anybody in jail, um, sure. only because it's been so many years and there might be some confusion. So let's get let's. I'll issue an order compelling him to do so within what do you want, 20 days? That's fine. Okay, and then if he doesn't do that, then you can come back and you know the jails I think are pretty opened up, and I'm not hearing about any uh, COVID out, uh, outbreak, so I can proceed to put people in jail on a rid of bodily attachment if they don't comply. But that's a little bit down the road for you. Sure. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. All right. Next case is Heidi Crumb versus. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure who. Oh, this is a. This is a. This is a probate case. Um, this is a petition for determination of homestead. Twenty one CP one two two. Who's here for the petitioner? Good morning, Your Honor. Jane Sonis here on behalf of Heidi Nix Crumb as the natural mother of Hannah Crumb, and also Tina White as an additional heir under the. Uh, Oh, I thought I, I don't. How is she an additional heir? I thought she, I thought in the affidavit of um, heirs that I recall. Let me just check here. Um, I thought there was no spouse. There's no spouse, Your Honor. It's Heidi Nix Crum is the ex-wife. She's the natural mother of Hannah Crum. Right. The <laughs> wife is an additional child that Carol Crum had. She is an adult. So those are the two uh, blood relatives that remain of the estate. He died in his in his domicile. Uh, living okay. in his domicile. Well, let, let me stop you. The, the problem with your petition is that you don't actually tell me who the um, 
re the homestead is is going to be distributed to you just say you want it to clear at homestead okay i mean if that's all you want i can do that but usually i also have a petition for telling me who you want it distributed to that is correct your honor that has not been determined yet because we just need the order determining homestead at this point because we're gonna have to establish a guardianship for hannah um, and we're also going to have to determine how much each of the two children will receive if it's different. So right now we're just looking for an order determining homestead. The home, the home, the house itself is under contract for mm -hmm. sale. And I want to make this uh, the order part of. The okay, well if that's all you want. That's fine. You can send me an order just determining the house homestead, and it'll have to be then the proceeds will have to be held if it's under contract um, for 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 future distribution. All right. Yep. So just send me an order to my office email address in word format, please. Thank you, Tim. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sonis. All right. Next case is reverse mortgage funding versus the estate of Joan C. Williams. This is 21 CA 1066. Who's here for the plaintiff? Good morning, Your Honor. Carissa Chin Duncan on behalf of the plaintiff. All right. And how about defendant? Anybody? All right. Well, this is a motion to determine confidentiality of trial records, which I found uh, interesting. Uh, I have handled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of foreclosure cases, and nobody's ever asked me to keep anything confidential. So I don't know why a reverse mortgage would be any different. What 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 would I be keeping confidential, Miss Duncan? We're asking to redact the loan number that's on the promissory note that's attached to the complaint. Why? Um, we're not able to redact it because we need to have the um, an identical copy of the note attached to the complaint in order to prove standing. But why and does it need to be confidential? Um, because it's the loan number and we don't want anyone else using that loan number for other purposes. I've never, ever had a loan number excised. Um, in any of the foreclosures that I've handled. How would it be possible that somebody would be able to use the loan number? Um, we would just worry about some sort of fraud being used. But again, how would that be possible? This isn't like a bank account. It's a, an actual document. Right? I mean, yes. I just, I, I just, I don't know that there's any precedence for this. Are, are you aware of any? I mean, if there is some, I'm happy to know about it. I just have never seen it. I don't have any. I, I don't exactly know how anybody would use the loan number. It's not, a, it's not an actually an account. So Okay, well, I'm gonna deny it without prejudice. I'll need an order to that effect sent to my office email address in Word format. If you can find okay. some pre you can find some precedent for it, some actually good reason to uh, to do this. I'm happy to revisit it, but at this point in time, I don't see the reason for it. Understood. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Next case is Collier County versus Dario Aviles and James Alby, 20 CA 3907. Who's here for the plaintiff? Uh, hi, Your Honor. This is Lorena Ludovici. I am here for the plaintiff. All right. And how about for any of the defendants? Uh, I do not think the county will be um, showing. They said they really don't have an interest in the motion to withdraw. Okay. This is a this is just to withdraw funds, and I didn't see any problem with it. And there's certainly nobody objecting. Correct. That's correct, Your Honor. Um, well, we were not able, to, the petitioner actually noticed a um, TOWD Point Master Funding Trust as a defendant. We haven't been able to get a hold of them. They haven't made an appearance. So we thought at best we just go ahead and um, set this for hearing okay. um, and notice it. So we did. Okay. So we would just like to, um, in fact, we'd like to um, just withdraw the funds and distribute them. Um, actually, they're going to go to Mears Corp anyhow. Okay. Granted, send me an order to my office email address in word format. Thank you, Your Honor. We also have a companion parcel on the Alby case. We we have a similar motion and there's no bank in that one. It's the same case number though. 
Um, are they the same? Yes, they are. It's the same case. One's for um, parcel 105 and the other's for parcel 104. Yes. So I've, I've granted the motion for both parcels. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Next case is roofing reconstruction versus Olympus Insurance 21 CA 148. Who's here for the plaintiff? Margaret Garner on behalf of the plaintiff, Your Honor. All right. Who's here for defendant? Erica Shaw on behalf of the defendant, Your Honor. Court reporter present as well. Okay. All right, this is a motion to dismiss, so Ms. Uh, Showell, go ahead. Good morning, Your Honor. This, we're here on defendant's motion to dismiss plaintiff's complaint because it fails to attach a uh, written itemized per unit cost estimate as required by Florida Statute 627.1752. The AOB that's attached to the complaint does not contain an estimate. One's not attached at all um, as required by the Florida Statute. And it's clear that the plaintiff is intending to comply with Florida Statute 627.7152 according to the language that's contained within the AOB. Uh, there's specific language that within the first paragraph of the AOB that the insureds purport to assign their post loss benefits under the policy of insurance with Olympus as per the terms of 627.7152 and further down within the AOB on the second page. It also indicates that the form satisfied all basic requirements of the Florida statute. Um, and they contain other areas within the 627.7152, such as the notice that is required in 18 point uppercase bold face type uh, per the statute. And the complaint itself requests relief under 627.715. Two. This AOB was signed July 11th, 2020, which is after uh, the new statute went into effect on July 1st, 2019. So it was required that the AOB comply with the, the new statute. Uh, the new statute mandates that the assignment agreement like plaintiffs must comply with the statute to be valid and enforceable. And Number four within the statute requires that the AOB contain a written itemized per unit cost estimate of the services to be performed by the signee. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, in paragraph one of the AOB, it says as defined by attached written itemized per unit cost estimate of the services to be performed by the signee, but the AOB fails to contain the attached itemized per unit cost estimate that it refers to. Even for argument's sake, if plaintiff it, um, is going to make the argument that they provided a copy of the uh, estimate prior to uh, suit being filed or that it should be contained or attached to the AOB, the estimate is dated after the insureds executed the AOB. Therefore, the insureds were not put on notice of the rights that they were assigning and what the estimate would have been prior to execution. In fact, it's dated a day after the AOB was executed. Uh, therefore, we believe that the plaintiff does not have standing in this action um, because it failed to comply with Florida Statute 627.7152 and the court should dismiss this case. Well, I don't have a copy of whatever estimate they have. It's not attached to the complaint, so. Correct, Your Honor. This is right. why we're moving to this mess. All right, Ms. Garner. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, I do apologize that our response was only filed yesterday. The attorney who was uh, handling this case, I was I was under the impression the response had already been filed. So I apologize for the late filing of that. Um, the two primary arguments that we have are first and foremost, which uh, I'm sure the court by now has heard the Menendez argument about retroactive application of uh, substantive changes to either the rights of the policyholder um, or where um, additional obligations are imposed on a contract that pre-existed a statute according to the Supreme Court. Okay, but the, the problem, but the problem is Garner is, is that you guys clearly intended to be to be governed by the statute. You clearly intended it. Well, Your Honor, that sort of brings us to the second point. If we want to, I can come back and do the constitutionality argument. Uh, the I, mean, more I think you've waived the constitutionality, uh, constitutionality argument because you clearly in your AOB, can, I can see that you intended to be governed by the new statute. 
Your Honor, and I understand the uh, the second point, though, is the question of whether the the assignment is valid or invalid under the law is governed by the rules of contracts, the common law, where it is not specified in the statute. And if the SFR case that I cited, it's a middle district of Florida case. It came out um, in March of this year. And uh, in the SFR services, LLC versus Indian Harbor Insurance Company, the United States Middle District Court um, Compare looking at this specific statute, 627.7152, and this specific issue that is being raised, said that while whether or not the, the compliance was required or intended, the insurance company is not the proper entity to raise the issue of the validity, because the question is whether the, the AOB non-compliance uh, renders it void or voidable. And uh, the SFR case goes through uh, the restatement on contracts, several different jurisprudences, uh, multiple uh, appellate cases from Florida over the years, along with a string of federal cases, which were cited in our motion as well, to come to the conclusion that uh, nowhere in the statute does it state that this is to protect the insurance company and rather that it is to protect the rights of the insured. And so therefore the rights to challenge an assignment must default back to Florida common law. And the common law is that a debtor, someone who is accused of breach um, of a contract, is the, their only legal defenses that they are able to raise are those that they would have been able to raise against the original um, assignor. And then any arguments they can raise and the court notes that they are extraordinarily limited, the topics that can be raised. Usually it is limited to things like the, the there was no right to assign in the contract whatsoever and therefore any assignment no matter how perfect it was would be invalid would be void as a matter of law the statute the court notes does not contain the void as a matter of law language rather it says it has to comply with these or it will be unenforceable but the question is who would seek to enforce it we are not seeking to enforce the right to build the home that or build or do the the repairs that are from the uh, from the insurance proceeds that we seek in this case. Um, I think the the best quote from SFR um, the SFR case sort of sums up this argument by saying, in a lawsuit such as this, the defendant's only interest is whether they he he is liable or they are liable in this case, not to whom he is liable. So essentially the argument of, is this an enforceable assignment under the policy, or excuse me, under the, uh, the new statute or not, is a question that lies and may never have to be answered, but will only have to be answered if there is a dispute when our uh, RCA seeks to enforce it against the insured by saying, here's the money that we obtained from your carrier, assuming we're successful in the case, here's the, the scope of the work that we are prepared to do. If the insured at that point says, I don't want you to do the work on my house, I just want that money, now there has been an attempt to enforce an assignment against the assignor who would then have the right to challenge the enforceability of it based on compliance with the statute. The uh, Britain itemized estimate was in terms of the, everyone having it and knowing about it. Uh, this goes beyond the four corners and we can't prove this. This would go to a waiver argument, Your Honor, uh, since you brought that up a moment ago, but against the defendant, which we can't, we can't plead until they file affirmative defenses. But uh, within three days, uh, the assignment was sent with the estimate uh, attached. It was sent to the homeowner. It was sent, the 10 day notice was sent to Olympus, again, attaching a copy of the estimate to which no response was received. And multiple times there are correspondence from Olympus and all of this is outside the four corners. So we can't prove that they have waived their right, even if they had it to raise this issue. But the most important uh, legal point is when it comes to an assignor and, and your honor mentioned that you do foreclosure, it would be like a bank suing on a foreclosure note where there had been an assignment of uh, of the note to them and the the uh, another bank trying to challenge uh, the assignment when they're not a party to that, or sorry, the, the original um, debtor trying to challenge the other bank's assignment when they're not a party to that lawsuit at that point, and they're not a party to that contract. This is the, the, the assignment was signed. There's no allegations. There's no evidence. Of course, the motion to dismiss, there can't be evidence. There's no allegations in the complaint and there's nothing that's been raised by the defendant to suggest that the insured has in any way challenged the validity of the assignment or the intent and the, the rights that they assigned there with. The only question in this lawsuit is, did the defendant fail to pay the proper amount owed pursuant to the policy at issue? 
And that policy is with the insured. And if the insured, it, whether they owe the money to us or to the insured is a question that at the end of this case, if we are successful, will be a matter resolved between the insured. Oh, no, it's not a question for the end of the case, madam, because I'm not going to, I'm, we're not going to process a case through the court system in which we don't know who, who's getting the money at the end. So it has to be set up correctly. And what that means is, is either you get a chance to amend, because I don't even have the estimate attached to the complaint Yes, sir. Um, or, and, or the defendant sues the homeowner, counter sues the, the, the homeowner in connection with the case. So it has to be set up a, a pro, uh, correctly to begin with. Also, I would note that the case that you're signing, citing the federal case is a federal trial court case. It is not an appellate case. So you I don't disagree, Your Honor. Yeah. So that's not legal authority for this court. Um, all right. So the motion's granted without prejudice. You've got 20 days to amend. Um, and also, Ms. Showell, you may or may not need to be filing a, a counter complaint against the homeowner because we're not going to get through the whole case and not know who's getting paid. All right, so I need an order from Ms. Showell um, sent to my office email address in word format, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, next case is Jasper at Sapphire Lakes versus Tower Hill, 20 CA 2596. Who's here for the plaintiff? Good morning, Your Honor. This is Sean Marker, counsel for the plaintiff. All right, who's here for defendant? Good morning, Your Honor. Patrick Zaman for Tower Hill. All right, this is plaintiff's motion to compel sooner deposition dates. It looked like the deposition dates that you were offered uh, were in November, am I correct? Uh, late October, Your Honor. We first requested the deposition in April and the soonest available dates that were provided were six months away into mm -hmm. the end of October. The issue is, is that it's a, it's a Hurricane Irma claim that was partially paid by Tower Hill. There's just a dispute about the scope and amount of the damage. Well, the issue is, is that the Supreme Court has said we're supposed to be finishing these cases up in 18 months, which would basically put you guys at trial in January, February of next year. Correct. So uh, October is a little bit late. Mr. Marker, what's the scoop? Yeah, we had requested the deposition of Tower Hill to be set sooner than that, because I agree with your honor, the trial in our case management plan is in February 2022. The fact witness discovery cutoff is just two months after this deposition date is uh, is set for right now. And it just leaves us right up to the wire. We're in a corner on this thing. Right. So, Mr. Zalman, I, Zalman, why, why can't we get deposition dates earlier than that? Well, Your Honor, first of all, when we were coordinating this date, uh, Plaintiff's Counsel, uh, their office accepted the date without objection. And then they turned around and filed this motion. Um, I think as everybody is aware that's practicing uh, first party property issues, the corporate representatives for almost every major insurance company are completely booked. Even now in April, they had dates available in October. If you try to schedule now, their dates are December, January. Uh, they're well, this is they're really, absolutely. yeah, and they should have hired more people. So I don't really have a lot of sympathy for them. We are required that may be true, to process these cases uh, on a timely basis. So you will have the depositions done no later than the end of August. Uh, Your Honor, uh, if I if I, I just want to interject for one second, this is highly prejudicial to Tower Hill because the only way that corporate rep could provide earlier dates is to cancel on another case, which would result in another motion to compel by another plaintiff in another lawsuit, which would prejudice that case. So it's just a cascading case. And you guys need to make your own professional decisions and perhaps you need to hire more corporate reps. Your Honor, they are hiring people. Well, I, I, Mr. Zalman, I'm not arguing with you. This is my order. This is my order and you can uh, govern yourself accordingly. So Mr. Marker, I need an order from you, corporate debt done by the end of August. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Yep. And you need to be available, so you're not allowed to say things like, "I have an, I have a vacation in August that I can't appear for." So, no, I'll, I'll make I'll make it available. I just need the corporate rep to be available for that. So, right. make it work, Your Honor. It, and, and, if, and if we, I mean, if we can't be available, I mean, we need some kind of. 
there has to be something in the order that if they're not available, we shouldn't be sanctioned for that. Uh, there's just absolutely uh, counsel, no this availability. Case, counsel, this case was filed. Let's see. Uh, 3791. I believe it was, filed. was filed in November of 2020. So there's right. no reason that you guys can't. And they request that, that, that's a year and a half ago. Your Honor, and they Sorry, requested that's, that's, that's less than a year ago. In April, <laughs> Mr. Marker's firm, this is their main practice area. They're well aware that corporate reps due to Irma claims and trial orders are booked up. They agreed to the October date and now they turned around and filed. Gentlemen, I do not argue with attorneys day. after I have ruled. I have ruled, you will deal with it. So I need an order from you, Mr. Marker. <laughs> I'll prepare that. Should we put any language in it, Your Honor, about them can't the corporate rep canceling their schedule to make themselves available? No, the you asked me for an order in order to stay on track in terms of your trial date. This is when you guys need to have this this deposition done. So the corporate rep before the end of August 2021. We'll we'll yep. prepare that order, Your Honor. Thank you. Well, I mean, if you guys want to agree to something else, that's fine with me. But that's my when you come into my court. That's my, Honor, that's we, my we already agreed to October 26th. Again, the, I have to again, I, gentlemen, I right. do not argue with attorneys after I have ruled. I have oh, ruled. Thank you. Mr. Marker, thank you. get me an order to my office email address and word format. I sure will. Thank you. Your thank Honor. you. Bye bye. All right. Next case is 20 CA 3791. Uh, this is also a Tower Hill case, and it's Linda Unbeckent versus Tower Hill. Who's here for the plaintiff? Your Honor, this is Leah Sibrin on behalf of the plaintiff. And who's here for defendant? Good morning, Your Honor. Elise Malouf on behalf of the defendant, Tower Hill Preferred. All right, this is plaintiff's motion to compel deposition. Go ahead. Yeah, I should have titled it um, Compel Sooner Deposition Dates. Mm -hmm. Again, this is also a first party property insurance claim. The claim was, uh, the complaint was filed back in November. Um, defendant was served with a uh, service of the complaint in December. We gave them a few, um, time to respond to the complaint in which then we first asked for our first request of the corporate representative deposition back in February 4th. They did not respond. We responded. Plaintiff responded March 30th, April 7th, April 12th to follow up. Um, again, we did not hear anything from the defendant until April 19th. They gave us dates um, uh, as early as October. We informed them that we would, um, on the same day, April 19th, we informed defendant that um, the dates were too far out in advance. They were about five to six months out in advance, but in any case, we would uh, book something, but we would file a motion to compel sooner dates uh, for the reason that it would cause undue delay and substantial burden to the plaintiff. It wasn't until- uh, just, just so you know, given the date of your, um, I think the previous case had been filed before yours, so I, I would, I would probably set the deadline at the end of September. Um, so anything you want to tell me about that, um, Ms. Maloof? No objection to uh, end of September, I guess last day of September deadline to complete the deposition. Yeah, so um, I, I would set the deadline at the end of September, last day of September. Now, I, I mean, again, I'm not sure that it's that much different than whatever your deposition dates are. At this point in time, the motion that you filed was filed in May. Um, so I would say the deadline for the corporate rep deposition is the last day of September. You guys can figure out what day that is, or if you want to agree to go with the October dates, that's up to you. But but since you asked, this is my ruling. Well, as of now, they only gave us dates for January of 2022 because they respond okay. to our emails 10. I thought you said they gave you an October date. Well, they did, but by the time we accepted, we we responded to the email within one day. They responded ten days later, so, and the date was suddenly gone. We we were uh, being okay. Well, again, my my deadline is the end of September. Yes, so I need an order from you, Miss Cibrian, sent to my office email address and word format, please. Yes, Your Honor. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next case is Giovanni. Campobasso versus Florida Peninsula Insurance, 20 CA 2727. Who's here for the plaintiff? Steve Johnson for the plaintiff, Your Honor. All right. And who's here for defendant? Good morning, Your Honor. Oscar Lombard on behalf of the defendant. All right. This is defendant's motion to dismiss and motion for sanctions. 
Yes, uh, Your Honor. So go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. As it relates to the motion for sanctions, um, it would be a 57-105. This is a first party property uh, contract action uh, filed by the insured claiming damage related to Hurricane Irma. Uh, specifically in the com amended complaint, uh, plaintiff requests a, a roof replacement as a form of their damages. Mm -hmm. However, on January 29th of 2020, the insured executed an assignment of benefits agreement with Apex Roofing and Restoration. And the plain language of that assignment indicates that all rights and benefits are assigned exclusively to Apex as it relates to services performed and to be performed. And in this case, Apex was going to replace the insured's roof and uh, therefore the insured's transferred their rights as it relates to the roof replacement to Apex. Um, and not only was that clear in the sole estimate provided uh, on in support of the insurance claim, but also by the amended complaint, which cites to an Apex contract in support of its claim for a roof replacement. Okay, so then the, the appropriate thing to do is file is for your client to file a counter complaint, not a motion to dismiss, because outside of the four corners of the complaint, they've assigned their benefits. And I, I, I definitely do not understand a motion for sanctions. Well, Your Honor, as it relates to the, the assignment of benefits, it the rights were given to the insured. And if it was within the four corners, we also look at the exhibits which were attached. Uh, one of the exhibits was a rescission of an assignment of benefits by a contractor named uh, Craftsman and an assignment by Craftsman. It's unclear what Craftsman assignment actually had because it cites to the wrong policy number and the wrong claim number and the rescission of that assignment cites to the wrong uh, policy number as well your honor so there, there's some ambiguity as it relates to what actually plaintiff uh whether he has standing what actually being there's claimed. no ambiguity at all in the complaint there's no ambiguity if you have a concern then you should file a counter complaint understood your honor on the, on the four corners of the complaint they've stated a cause of action he's the he's the homeowner he had an insurance policy there was damage you guys haven't paid yes your honor as it relates to the four corners i would just point out in in terms of our motion for more definite statement the deficiencies in the actual complaint which cites to the wrong policy it cites two exhibits which aren't numbered. It cites an exhibit that's not even there, which is the actual contract as exhibit A, which it fails to include. So at a minimum, I'd ask the, the court that the plaintiff amend its complaint to, to add the appropriate exhibit and add the actual policy, which it's citing to, but it's actually not including. Well, do they have a copy of the policy? Have you given yes, it? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. The copy of the, of the policy was provided to uh, counsel on June 9th, 2020, prior to the suit being filed. Okay. All right, so Mr. Johnson, argument? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, you are correct that the argument goes outside the four corners of the of the complaint and its attachments. But if you look closely uh, at the complaint, it alleges that uh, at the time that the Apex Roofing and Restoration Assignment of Benefits was executed, the homeowner who allegedly assigned those benefits did not have any uh, right to assign them because he had already executed the assignment to craftsmen. So therefore, the document that the defendant relies upon is invalid and unenforceable. For at the time that it was executed, plaintiff had no benefits to assign. They had already been assigned to craftsmen. As alleged in the amended complaint, and as the documents show, the reassignment from craftsmen to the plaintiff did not occur until June 8th, 2020. Yeah, Simply well, I'm, I'm more concerned about the policy number and the failure to attach the policy. Okay. Uh, we could certainly amend to add the policy and attach the policy. Okay. All right. So I'm going to grant it, um, grant the motion to dismiss in part based only on whether or not the policy number that's set forth in paragraph four of the amended complaint is correct and also to attach the policy. Otherwise, I'm de denying the motion to dismiss on the gr other grounds stated therein and I'm denying the motion for sanctions. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. So I'll need an order from Mr. Uh, Labana um, to that effect sent to my office email address in word format, please. Thank you, Your Honor. And uh, we have one more, uh, actually, a motion to compel uh, depositions on each side, Your Honor. Uh, mm -hmm. Defendant asked uh, for the deposition of the insured on September 18, 2020, which uh, preceded plaintiff's uh, request. We asked that the both depositions occur within 90 days. Plaintiff's 
deposition to occur. First, first of all, I do not see that this is set. I see that defendant's motion to dismiss is set. Defendant's motion for sanctions is set. And plaintiff's your, your, opposition. Your Honor, I apologize. That's my mistake. You're right. I apologize. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to help you guys sort it out if you want uh, me to today, but it's not properly noticed. I, I am sure I could get an agreement with the counsel. Okay. So Thank just, you. I mean, again, whoever asks first gets to have their depositions first, and then we proceed along. But uh, the Supreme Court has made it very clear that it expects us to process these cases on a timely basis, pursuant to the rules of judicial administration, and that's what we're doing. So. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have a good day, Aaron. Uh -huh. All right, Kathy, that's it for the 8.30 docket. We have a 1.30 hearing. Correct. All right. And you heard that that trial is settled, correct? Yes. Yeah, I'm so. disappointed because I wanted to train somebody. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, I've notified Judge Hayes and Judge Brody, um, and so maybe they'll be able to use that time. Oh, okay, great. But we should have a lot of trials starting in July. Um, cause I think the courthouse is going to be completely open and, um, we, as you know, have a huge inventory of trials. So, uh, right. buckle up. Do you know when in July? Just my regular trial docket. 